Amen. All right. Uh, before we before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, how grateful we are that you've allowed us to be here today. Uh, Lord, in your sovereignty, you knew that we'd be here. And you knew that we would be celebrating a very special day. Father, we thank you for Grandma Moore. Yes. And we thank you that we have the honor, the privilege, the blessing to be here today and to celebrate 100 years. But Lord, most importantly, what we desire, and I know Grandma Moore agrees with me, is to uplift and honor the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. The name above all names, the giver of life. So Father, uh, bring glory to your name, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Man, so uh, how often do you get the chance to come together to celebrate a 100-year birthday? This is my first one. I'm literally half her age. Literally. And this is my first 100th birthday celebration. So we are here uh, to celebrate Miss Velma Oletta Mort. Uh, her maiden name is Milton, but we all know her as Grandma Mort. And by the way, Sherry, Mom, you were right. Her first name was Velma. Uh, I've just always known her as Miss Mort. So I've always known her as. So why, why, do we, why do we celebrate birthdays, whether it's an 8-year-old, a 100-year-old, a 50-year-old? Why, why celebrate birthdays? Well, I'll tell you why. Because celebrating a birthday is an expression of thanks to God for the gift of life. That's right. It's an expression of, of thanks to God for the gift of of life. One, the gift of, of not only of being born, but the gift of still being alive. How many of you know the only reason any of us are here is because of the grace of God? That's right. That's right. Some of us have tempted that grace more than others. Sure have. Amen. But it's still the grace of God that we're able to be here today and not only celebrate her birthday, but celebrate our birthdays. Mm -hmm. And we give God the glory for that when we celebrate these things. Proverbs 9 11 tells us. God says, for by me, your days will be multiplied and years of life will be added to you. Loved ones, every day is a wonderful gift of God's grace yeah. that we should celebrate and we should enjoy. Not only do we celebrate because we give God thanks for the gift of life, we celebrate because it's an opportunity for us to reflect on the past and give God the glory, to acknowledge the present and give him the glory yes. and to consider the future and give him the glory. In Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, it says this. It says, the Lord's acts of mercy indeed do not end. There's good news. Mm -hmm. Aren't you glad to know that at 25, his mercies don't end? That's right. At 50, his mercies don't end. At 100, his mercies don't end. That's right. And, and it goes on to say, for his compassions do not fail. More good news. Uh -huh. Our compassions fail. It's true, isn't it? Yes. How many of you know God's compassions never yes. fail? It says that they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, those of you that know me, you already know where I'm about to go. I got curious. If God's mercies are new every morning, mm -hmm. how many is that in a hundred years? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I'm going to let you go home and do the math on that one. But let me, let me tell you what I come to discover. We, we, we serve a merciful God. Yes, we do. We serve a compassionate God. We serve a God who is faithful, as the scripture says here. A hundred years of mercy. A hundred years of compassion. And God's bank still hadn't even come close to running dry. Thank you. That's the God that we're here to celebrate as we also honor Grandma Mort for her hundred years. God is the giver of life. Yes. He is the sustainer of life. Yes. It is his grace that allows us to be here today. Yes. It is his mercy that is new every morning. It is his compassions that do not fail. And it is his faithfulness that gives us the privilege to be here and the blessing to be here. So yes, we absolutely honor Miss Mort. Absolutely, that's why we're here. But we glorify God for the gift of 100 Amen. years. Yes. Now I learned a new word as I, as I was looking this up. I learned a new word. You know, who knows what you call somebody that's 100 years old? 
Who knows the word? And, and Sister Yvonne isn't allowed to say because me and her already talked about this. <laughs> the word is a centenarian. Centenarian is someone that is 100 years old. We are in the presence of a centenarian. And, and a lot of people will ask, a lot of people will ask, what's the secret to a long life? What's the secret to living 100 years? Well, I, I read a story about a man that had turned 100. Him and his wife actually both turned 100. And the family was celebrating the birthday. And he was surrounded by all of his grandkids and great-grandkids. And they were all talking about how good he looked. He looked healthy. He, he was well-preserved. He was, he was alert. And they was asking him, well, Grandpa, what's the secret? He said, all right, listen up, kids. I'm going to tell you the secret of my success. He said, 75 years ago, when your grandmother and I were married, on our wedding day, we made a solemn pledge to one another. We agreed that whenever we had an argument or a fight, that the one who was proved wrong would have to go outside and walk five miles. He said, my boy, I've been walking in the open air almost every day for some 75 years now. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit confused the boy asked he said but grandpa I don't understand he said grandma is just as slim and energetic as you are grandpa said well son that's another secret he said you see your grandmother would always follow me on those five miles to make sure I walked them and I didn't just go sit in the park for a couple of hours <laughs> they know don't they guys they know <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Let, let me let me share with you the secret to long life right now. Because I'll, I'll be honest with you, some people, man, they can eat cheeseburgers and bacon twice a day mm -hmm. and, and live a long life. Mm -hmm. uh, some people eat salads and, and you know exercise, they live a long life. Loved ones, I assure you, God is the reason for long life. That's right. Yeah. It is a gift of God. Yes. It truly is. Yes. So uh, again, we give him the glory. Yes. But I did ask some questions uh, this week. I became curious. I thought, what are some truths about being a centenarian? What are some truths about that? Well, truth number one for a centenarian is that the world they're in now was not the world they grew up in. The world they're in now is not the world they grew up in. You say, Scott, what do you mean by that? Well, loved ones, life 100 years ago was very different. Very different than it is today. Let me give you some examples. Uh, in the Roaring Twenties, that's when Miss Mort was born, in the Roaring Twenties, the population of the U.S. was about 110 million. Our current population today is over 333 million people. Three times more people was here now than then. Just go to Nashville if you don't believe me. It's shoulder to shoulder. The price of a Model T Ford, which was uh, basically the only vehicle available to you, was $319. 40% of the homes had electricity, 40% had electricity. Most of rural America would remain without electricity until the mid-1930s. About 35% of homes had a telephone. Well, that's a joke today, isn't it? <laughs> Today, 100% of homes have about eight telephones uh, throughout it. 35% had a telephone. The number one movie of 1922 was the silent adventure film Robin Hood, starring Douglas Fairbanks and Wallace Beery. Who, who, here, who here has ever actually watched a silent movie? Brother John, okay, Christine. Oh, a few more than I thought, okay. Okay, and most of you wasn't even out of necessity. You just chose to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. America's first chocolate-covered ice cream bar came out on January 24th, 1922. The Eskimo Pie. It was a different world back then. Simpler. Simpler. Now, here's something that'll get you. Let me share with you some of the average prices of, of things in the 1920s. A round steak sold for 32 cents a pound. Ladies, how much is it now? 
Yeah, well, see, that's the answer right there. <laughs> more, than, more than you want to know. Eggs were 44 cents a dozen. What are they now? Four or five dollars? Six ninety nine. Six ninety nine at Publix. There you go. Milk sold for fifty two cents a gallon. A loaf of bread was nine cents. Coffee was thirty six cents a pound. I would have died of caffeine overdose. Here's a good one. A ten pound bag of potatoes was twenty eight cents. I don't even want to ask how much it was now. Oh, this one's really going to get everybody right here. Gasoline sold for 25 cents a gallon. I want to go back to the 20s. How about you? The price of a first class postage stamp was two cents. A movie ticket went for seven cents. And in the 20s, uh, and, and I could spend a lot of time on this, but allow me to sum it up. In the 20s, new technology led to new inventions. Uh, some of the first ones coming out, washing machines, freezers, vacuum cleaners. It, it changed the households. It changed the way homes uh, operated and ran. It, it really did. It, on one hand, it was a very exciting time. On the other hand, it was also a very difficult time. And we'll get that here in just a minute. Uh, lastly, $100 in the 1920s was the equivalent of $1,654 today. The dollar was different back then. It's a different world than Grandma Moore grew up in. That's right. Completely different. Secondly, another truth about a centenarian is that they lived through a lot of history. A lot of history. For example, she was seven years old when the Great Depression began in 1929. And she was 17 when it ended in 1939. Now, let me, let me state the obvious here. That generation is completely different than the generation we know today. They knew how to appreciate what they had. They knew the value of things. They didn't carry the sense of entitlement that we see today. They knew how to work for what they want. And they, they learned the value of doing without you say, Scott, there's no value in there. Come see me after service. I want to talk to you. There's great value in learning to do without because you learn to be appreciative for what you have. You learn to thank God for everything you have. We live in a disposable world, don't we? Everything's disposable. Make it in order to throw it away and get you a new one. Back in that day, they held on to what they had. She lived through the Great Depression as a teenager. Impressive? Yeah. Impressive. She has lived, this is, in, this is crazy, she has lived through 19 presidents. 19 presidents. She was six years she old. the president's <laughs> If she can name all 19 of them, I'm done preaching. Man, that, that's, that's, all the, that's all the sermon I need to hear right there. She was six years old when the first TV broadcast on January 13th, 1928 came out. First TV broadcast. She was there for that. She lived through the atrocities of the Second World War from 1939 to 1945. She was alive when the first Reader's Digest was published. So many things I discovered as I was reading the history of what she has been through uh, that she could tell us, yes, I remember that. Centenarians have seen and experienced a thing or two, and you know what that means? They have wisdom to offer. They have wisdom that they can offer to people. The Bible tells us in Job 32, 7, that age should speak and increased years should teach wisdom. A lot of wisdom in a hundred years. Thirdly, a centenarian has learned what things in life has true value. They've learned what things in life has true value. You see, many people want to put value on things. They want to put value on stuff. They believe the fancy new car is what gives value to their life. They believe the big house gives value to their life. They believe money gives value to their life. It's what they pursue because they believe in those things is where value 
lies. Well, the Bible says this in 23, Proverbs 23, 4 through 5. It says, do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Stop dwelling on it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies towards the heavens. You can't hang on to it. The same preacher in Ecclesiastes said, it's vanity of vanities to pursue material, temporary things. So what, what value does a centenarian learn? What value would Miss Moore tell you? Really, really, it should be the focus in life. Well, let me put it to you this way. Miss Mort had four kids. She has 16 grandkids. She has 16 great grandkids. And she has 18 great, great grandkids. And from my understanding, Brother John told me those numbers might actually be a little low because the family is so big, he had a hard time getting all of them. That's right. So I'm being conservative with these numbers. Let me tell you something, loved ones. When that day comes, when Miss Mort is surrounded by her family, she's not going to be talking about cars. She's not going to be talking about houses. She's not going to be talking about money. She's going to be surrounded by the most important thing in her life. Family. Mm -hmm. That's the true value of life. Yes. She can tell you with absolute certainty, riches mean nothing. They carry no value. They come and they go overnight with just a snap of a finger. But the relationships we build in life, mm -hmm. where we speak into one another's lives, we laugh together, we cry together, yes. we hug one another, we rejoice together, all of these things is what brings value to life. That's right. Fourthly, and this is a truth that I want everybody to hear today. Even 100 years is short compared to eternity. That's right. That's right. That's right. 100 years is short compared to eternity. Listen to what the Bible has to say about the, the brevity of life. In Job 8, 9, it says, For we are only of yesterday and know nothing. When he says we know nothing, what we mean is in the grand scope of the world, do we really think we know something? Mm -hmm. In the grand scope of the universe, of the creation of God, of life itself, do we really believe we've got it figured out? And we are only of yesterday. We can just leave that there. Thank you, Lorena. I'm not thirsty anyhow. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm not even a pulpit pounder. <laughs> so I don't know how that happened. <laughs> he goes on to say, he says, because our days on earth as as a shadow. A shadow has no substance. The shadow is representative of our years here on earth. Eternity is the substance that casts the shadow. James 4.14 tells us this. He says, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow for you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You know, in my 20s, I would have heard something like that and thought, eh, yeah. Now I'm 50 and I'm going, yep. Yeah. I wonder, how, I wonder what, what response a centenarian would give you. Loved ones, our time here on earth comparatively is short. Whether it's 100 years, whether it's 10 years, whether it's 30 years, compared to eternity, it is short. Now listen to how a couple of the psalmists had the wisdom to understand the brevity of life and their prayer unto God. Moses in Psalm 39.4 asked, Lord, let me know my end and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. Moses wanted to understand how short his life really was, where he could live it in its, in its fullness unto God. So often we make our life's pursuit about us instead of about God. Right. So often that's what we right. do. Right. David in Psalm 90, 12 asked this. He says, so teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. A wise heart considers the shortness of life and the reality 
of eternity. A wise heart ponders the question, where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? What is my purpose here upon this earth? The reality of eternity, loved ones, we're all going to face eternity one day. It's a fact. It's a fact. And there are two destinations for man. There is not a third choice. There is heaven and there is hell. Those are the two destinations the Bible tells us about. Let me tell you a truth. Hell will be filled with sinners and heaven will be filled with the holy. God's standard for heaven is perfection. That's the only way we can get in, is by being absolutely morally perfect. When Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, a lot of people believe that sermon was a really feel-good, uplifting message uh, for, for the world and for believers. Actually, it was a severe indictment of the sinfulness of man's heart. Because Jesus exposed our hearts as being lustful, murderous, adulterous, and selfish. And then at the very end of the sermon in Matthew 5, 48, Jesus said this. He said, therefore, you shall be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Jesus was giving the standard for entrance into heaven. Absolute perfection. But see, man has a problem. Man has missed that mark. That's right. We have missed the standard that God has given to be allowed entrance into his presence. The Bible tells us in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, the picture is of an archer who takes their bow and they take their arrow and they draw back and they're aiming for a target and they release the arrow, but they miss the target. Well, loved ones, the target for man is moral perfection. And we had our shot at it, and we missed it. We missed the target that God gave us. We have all violated God's moral law. We have all committed cosmic treason against the creator of the universe. In God's law, he said he wants us to tell the truth, and we lie. He said he does not want us to steal, and we have taken things that didn't belong to us. He said, I don't want you to be selfish, but we are. He said, I don't want you to take my name in vain, but we have. And that's not just saying GD. We hit our foot on the corner of our bed, and we say, oh, my G-O-D. Or we take the name of the Lord Jesus in vain. Loved ones, we have all, as the Bible said, fallen short of the glory of God. Yes. We have disqualified ourselves from entrance into heaven with our sin. Most understand doing bad will keep you out of heaven. Few understand doing good cannot get you in either. Right. We understand that, don't we? Doing bad, oh yeah, that'll keep yeah. you out of heaven. <laughs> Hitler's bad. Stalin is bad. Jeffrey Dahmer is bad. But see, then we start to look at ourselves. And instead of accurately seeing ourselves the way the Bible portrays us as liars, thieves, adulterers, blasphemers, instead we begin to sort of say, well, look at all the good that I do. Loved ones, God rejects our attempts at self-righteousness. The Bible says our attempts at self-righteousness are like filthy rags. Jesus said in John 14, 6, very clearly, and this is a very exclusive statement with no room for, for uh, discussion. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Right. Our works can't get us into heaven. God rejects those. But the work Jesus Christ did on the cross grants access to heaven. Right. It's not our work that gets us in. It's his work that gets us in. Right. We must put our faith in Jesus Christ and his work upon the cross. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says this, 
It says Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. Now that's a fancy theological word that means he is the satisfaction of our sins. Mm -hmm. Because you see, God is holy and man is sinful. Because God is holy, God demands justice for sin. Mm -hmm. He demands sin be punished, otherwise he's not holy. Imagine somebody commits a terrible crime. Terrible crime. Picture one in your own mind. They, they assault a young girl or, or something just absolutely horrible. And they're standing in court and, and the judge calls, calls the, uh, uh, the offender up and says, okay, you have committed this crime. Now the law says I must punish you. The law says I must be a good judge and I must give justice to you for your crime. How would you feel? What would you think if that man stood up and said, Your Honor, yes, I did that. I did that terrible crime. But I want to tell you all the good things I've done. And then that should release me from this terrible crime. What would you think about that judge if he went, You know what? You're right. You have done a lot of good things. I'm going to excuse you from this crime you committed against that girl. You would call for that judge to be in jail, wouldn't you? You would be outraged if such a thing happened. Well, loved ones, there's no difference than when we as sinners stand before a holy God and try to say, yes, God, I lied. Yes, I, I committed fornication. Yes, I, I blasphemed your name. Yes, I did all these terrible things against you and against your holiness. But God, I want to tell you all the good things that I did too. You see, loved ones, how that doesn't stand? It can't stand. So when the Bible says Jesus was the satisfaction of, of God's standard, he was the satisfaction of God's requirements, how did Jesus satisfy God's demands? Well, once he lived a sinless life. He lived a perfectly sinless life. Where me and you failed, he succeeded. He met the standard. That's right, he drew the bow back, released the arrow, and hit it dead center with a perfect life. Yes. Because that's what God requires. Yes. Perfection. Yes. Where we told lies, Jesus only spoke truth. Where we lusted, he only had purity of heart and purity of mind. When we stole, he only gave. When we took the Lord's name in vain, he only used it to bring honor and glory to his Father's name. He lived the perfect life, yes. an amazing life, a unique individual, fully God yet fully man. Mm -hmm. And he met the standard. And the Bible's clear about this too. In 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, it says this. It says, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. When the Bible speaks of the blood of Christ, it's referring to the death of Christ. Yes. And he was spotless. He was unblemished. No sin touched him. He did what we couldn't do. Right. He succeeded where Adam failed. Right. He was the second Adam mm -hmm. that lived the perfect life, that met God's moral standard, and that sacrificed himself upon the cross so that all who would believe in him could have eternal life in his place. That's why I say it. we've got to put our faith in his work, not ours. Mm -hmm. We look to the cross. We don't look to our good deeds because we have no good deeds to look to. And you see, loved ones, here, here's something that's even much more amazing. You hear people say, oh, I love Jesus. Well, that's only because he loved you. That's right. The Bible says it's not that we loved him, but he loved us and gave his life as a ransom for many. Mm -hmm. I love that scripture because it reminds me who initiated the gift of salvation. God did. Yes. And he yes. sent his son to die upon a cross, a cross that I should have died upon, a cross you should have died upon. That's right. We should have died for our sins, amen? That's right. But Jesus loves you so much, he took your place upon that cross. Mm -hmm. He carried it for you. 
He died upon it for you. And that's why Isaiah 53, 5 through 6 is so convicting because it says this. Speaking of Jesus, it says he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him and by his wounds we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. In other words, we said, God, I will not do life your way. I'm going to do it my way. We've turned from him. Mm -hmm. But the Lord caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. Thank you, Lord. That's love. Yes. That's grace. Yes. That's mercy. Jesus looked at God the Father and said, they can't do it. Send me. That's right. That's right. But it doesn't stop there. If Jesus died upon the cross and that was it, then he was just another man. How do we know Jesus was who he says he was? How do we know he was indeed the son of man and the savior of the world? How do we indeed know he lived the perfect life because love was three days later he rose out of that grave? Amen. Yes. He lives. Yes. He is not a dead Savior. That's right. They took him off the cross dead, but, but the grave couldn't hold him and death couldn't, uh, the death couldn't handle him and the grave couldn't hold him. That, that's, right. He rose out of the grave three days later, yes. triumphantly overcoming sin, overcoming death, yes. overcoming hell, overcoming every enemy of God yes. at that moment, having absolute authority on heaven and on earth. And he still has that authority today because he lives today. Yes. He sits at the right hand of the throne of God, ready to offer forgiveness to any that will call upon him. Yes. He himself said in John 11, 25 through 26, at a funeral of all places, <laughs> encouraging the sisters of the one that had died, he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Yes. Loved ones, right. Jesus Christ is the only way yes. into the eternal home of God's kingdom. Yes. We must repent of our sins. We must confess that we are what the Bible says we are. Mm -hmm. We are sinners that has fallen short of the glory of God. Yes. We must confess Jesus Christ is who he says he is, mm -hmm. the son of God that died for the sins of the world. Yes. And then we must ask him to create in us a new heart. Mm -hmm. One that desires God, not self. Mm -hmm. One that desires righteousness, not sin. That's right. One that loves the things of God and hates the things of the world. Mm -hmm. Jesus loves you. He did what you couldn't. He lived the perfect life. He met the standard. He died upon the cross. He satisfied the wrath of God. And he is alive and well today and sitting in absolute authority over all of creation. Whether you want that to be true or not, it doesn't change the reality. Jesus Christ has authority over all things. 100 years. What a blessing. What a blessing. But we don't know our days. Imagine how much more of a blessing to spend an eternity with one another. Yes. Yes. How much more of a blessing to spend an eternity with Christ Jesus. Loved ones, he's the only way. So my desire today was to honor the birthday girl. My desire today was also to speak the truth of the gospel yes. of Jesus Christ. A yes. hundred years is a drop in the ocean compared to eternity, loved ones. Yes. Amen. Yes. Pray with me. Father, take these words, I pray. And whoever whoever needs whoever needs to hear it, I pray you grant them a correct response. Yes, Lord. I pray, Father, that you draw them to you with your love, your mercy that's new every morning, your compassion that does not fail, your faithfulness. Yes, Lord. Father, I pray that you show them the need for Jesus, the need for a Savior. Yes, Lord. Father, truth be told, uh, your word makes it clear. We love darkness. But Lord, we know that because you have authority over all things, you can pierce that darkness. 
So Lord, I'm asking this morning that you pierce the darkness of any heart that is yet to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and confess their sins and ask for forgiveness and discover the joy of being ushered into your presence and being given a new heart and a new life one fit for eternity to be in the presence of your holiness. That's true. Father, show them the love that you have for them, that you sent your son to die. So, Father, let it be your work in their hearts, I pray, as a result of your word that pierced it. And we'll give you the glory, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, just a couple things before uh, we, we dismiss everybody. Number one, uh, I am going to lock up the sanctuary here. So if you have anything that, that you don't want locked up, uh, take it with you, perhaps put it, put it in your car. Uh, and also, Brother John, I believe, uh, has something that he would like to read for all of us. It's been quite a few years now that Viola and our family moved to Tennessee. And uh, the, the reason we came to Tennessee was I thought I was a songwriter. <laughs> well, I, when, I, when, I got to, when I got to Tennessee, I found out I had a lot to learn. <laughs> But I wanted to uh, uh, share something with you that as a songwriter, I wrote uh, because I was grateful to have a mother like I had. I wrote the song about her, but it was uh, it's also a, a song that I wanted to write to glorify God. So... Uh, The, the things that we, how many times have we heard God is good? And, and we, we know that he's not bad, he's, he's a perfect God. Okay. You can't hear me very good, Mom? Uh, Can you hear me now? Yeah. I'm on one of those commercials about telephones. Can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, how many times have we heard about God being good and, and, and that the results of what God does is goodness. Well, that's the song I wrote, and I wrote it about for my mom, and I wanted to read it so mom could hear it. She heard it again, and I think she liked it, but she likes everything I read. <laughs> I picture this with a, 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 a kind of up-tempo rock and roll sound to it. <laughs> <laughs> Mama used to tell me, John, you be good. And I tried hard to please her because I liked the way her face lit up and I loved the way her eyes were. Mama used to look at me with lots of love when she saw that I'd been good. And she said both her and God were pleased when I acted the way I should. I remember me then, and I see me now, and I know that I went wrong. But I'm going to look for goodness again and sing about it in my songs. I know where I went wrong. I tried to please myself. I forgot to reach for good and ask for the good Lord's help. Mama used to say that God was goodness and for more good to reach for him. 
And I know it's true because the more I do, the more good comes from within. Thank you, Mom.